Good morning, everybody. Welcome to TGI Sports Talk with Keith Engel. We're live from East Greenbush, New York. Still, as Mark loves to hear me say, the only live streaming sports cast from East Greenbush. Um, beautiful day this morning, a beautiful morning, and it looks like it's going to be a pretty good couple days here in the Northeast. Maybe some rain on Sunday. We can stay in and watch some football, uh, whatever football there is. Um, I want to thank my guests from last week. Uh, Ken Schott from the Daily Gazette. We had a great chat about uh, pro football and a little, some other topics. Uh, and I do thank Ken for coming on. And my guest today is Dick Weiss. Dick is a Hall of Fame sports writer. Uh, worked for the Philadelphia uh, Daily News 40 years with the New York Daily News covering the college sports scene, as, uh, uh, among a lot of other things. Uh, contributor. I, I've heard him on the radio over the years on ESPN radio, WFAN, uh, lots of the outlets you probably have followed yourself. Um, and we're going to talk today mostly about college football, both college basketball, Dick's new books. Uh, he's got a ton of books out that he's written with uh, uh, guys like Dick Vitale and John Calipari and uh, Rick Pitino. Wrote a book about Coach K. And he's got a new book uh, with Dick Vitale out that we were just chatting about. So we'll bring Dick in. We'll get a little of his background, and we'll go from there. Good morning, Dick. Hey, Keith. It's so nice talking to you. It's great having you with me. I've, I've read your stuff for years. Um, that only I'll, makes me sound a lot old, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm probably behind you, but I feel like I'm catching up quickly. Um I think we all are. <laughs> yeah. You know, as I said, I, the, the Daily News is where I know you're from. But I, I used to read a lot of out-of-town newspapers. I, I used to love uh, when I could find them and get them. So I've, I've, I've seen you in other places. Um, I know, I've heard you in a lot of outlets, as I said, and ESPN. and The fan, I believe uh, you were on, I guess, a lot of times uh, uh, there. And now you've moved up to TGI Sports Talk. So this is kind of the pinnacle uh, of your career, probably, I'm assuming. Hey, I, I love it. I love it. <laughs> It'll be nice talking to you. <laughs> Give us a little of your background, if you would, uh, Dick, real quick before we jump into the college football scene here. Well, I, 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 I've I spent most of my life as a uh, newspaper man. My latest, uh, I spent, I was at the New York Daily News from 1993 through 2015 as a national college football and basketball columnist. Uh, it was when it was good before newspapers started uh, going into a collapse mode. I was it, it was in my mind, as good a job as you can have in the business because they never said no. And they would send me just about everywhere. I think that Ward Zuckerman, the publisher, loved having date lines. And uh, I probably spent a lot more of their money than I should have. But they they were very, very good to me. And uh, so during college football and college basketball, I would go to any big game that I wanted to see. Uh, throughout the country. Uh, and um, I've also written 14 books, a uh, number with Dick Vitale. I've written books with uh, Rick Pitino, John Calipari. I've written books on, as you said, with uh, a book on Mike Krzyzewski. I've written a book with Teresa Krentz, who was the uh, 1992 Women's Olympic coach. Uh, just finished a two books during this pandemic. One is called The Lost Season with Dick Vitale, which is about the NCAA tournament that didn't take place last year. And we do a simulated uh, 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 bracket uh, at the end uh, and, actually pick, and actually pick a winner. And I've also uh, done a book with a guy named Mike McDonald, who uh, Played on the Rutgers 75 team, which is the first team in school history 
to go to the NCAA basketball tournament. And uh, he went on from there to become the president of the largest division at Xerox and has become a CEO at a huge weight loss company, Metafast, down in, 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 in Baltimore. And here's a kid who grew up on the poor side of the tracks. His yeah. family did not have a, uh, did not own a house. They rented six different places when he was growing up, did not have a car till he was 15. And he, it's a great rags to riches story. And it's a good business motivational story on some of the techniques that he used to uh, achieve where he, where, where he's at that just, I just finished the manuscript for that uh, this week. So it's, it's kept me busy. I followed that team pretty closely in my younger years. I remember that. Yeah, team. I really yeah. liked that team. I mean, they had, they had four future pros. They had uh, Phil Sellers, Eddie Jordan, Mike Dabney, uh, Hollis Copeland, who also all got some time in the NBA uh, as players. And, you know, Rutgers, it wasn't like at school with a huge pedigree. They had... Uh, not even been to a postseason tournament till 1967, back when Jimmy Valvano and Bob Lloyd, who was a, a first-team All-American, both were in the backcourt and had never gone to an NCAA tournament until 1975. It's not a, it's a school that is a public ivy, doesn't have a great um, – athletic tradition unless you consider women's basketball where mm -hmm. Teresa Grants and, and, and Vivian Stringer are both in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Well, we're going to jump in. Uh, I think towards the end, we'll get, we'll go back to college basketball because it, it's funny. Sure. Rutgers, Whatever you want. Kind of highly rated this year. So we'll touch on that a little bit. <clears throat> I want to start with the, the college football scene, I guess. And, uh, you know, Alfred, we're off to a, a start, if even an uneven start with the, SEC and the ACC already with a few games under their belt and still a few weeks before the Big Ten and Pac-12 start. Um, I mean, let me start with, with the with the obvious point, I guess, Dick. Do you think the universities, are, well, the NCAA, I guess, made the right decision in starting the season? Well, I, th I everything's a gamble. Um, I Is it safe to play? There have been – a number of teams who have had canceled games. There have been at least three head coaches, Mike Norvell, Les Miles, Kevin Sumlin, who have tested oh, positive for, 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 for COVID. Yeah. Uh, there have been a, a number of leagues, not, num not number of leagues, but two major leagues, uh, the uh, Pac-10 and, uh, and, uh, uh God, who was the and the Big Ten that haven't even started playing games yet? Right. It's funny when you look at the uh, top ten this week, Keith. I mean, there are actually four teams from the ACC in the Pac-10. Now, one of them is Notre Dame, which is playing a uh, a full ACC schedule this year, uh, along with North Carolina and Clemson and uh, uh, Miami, but it been a long time since there's been that many teams. Now, that's all going to change once uh, the Big Ten starts to play. There have been a number of players who have opted out that would have been stars in the right. league. Uh, mm -hmm. Michael Parsons from Penn State is a, a locked first-round linebacker, and he uh, opted out of the season, as did a number of other players. Uh, so you, I think if they were going to play – the best thing for them to do is probably play this fall because had they postponed the season until the spring, it's hard to tell how many stars would have played. A lot of them may have just pulled out in order to prep for the combine and prep for the uh, NFL draft because they realize that the NFL is not going to move uh, the draft from next spring. And yeah, so you might have lost none. a lot of people. My guess would be none of them would have played in the spring. So yeah, I think it might have. It might have looked a lot more like a JV sport or a sport with a lot of freshmen and sophomore playing key roles. 
So with that said, I mean, obviously we do have a season. Hopefully we can get through it. You mentioned sure. the, you mentioned the uh, canceled games. I, I counted between 25 and 30 up to now with three again this right. week. Uh, you mentioned the coaches. I didn't know about Kevin Sumlin. That's a new one for me. Yeah. I heard about the Mad Hatter the other day. <laughs> he may be happy he's out for a few weeks. I don't know. He's having a tough well, start. I was going to say, you know, giving Kansas his track record the last <laughs> couple of years, it's probably a much needed rest. <laughs> right. So we'll talk a little bit. Let's talk about the season on a whole first before we dive into sure. some, some surprises and disappointments and specific situations. So with the playoff situation, well, first of all, I think the NCAA missed a perfect opportunity to maybe expand it myself. Expand it, right. I totally agree with it. you. Because it's going to be hard when we get to four teams, when you've got some teams that have played 11 or 12 games, and the Pac-10, or I'm sorry, Pac-12, when, when they pl start playing in November, seven games, they have any kind of cancellations like we've had so far, and it's not reasonable to think there won't be some. They're not going to be able to make those games up. So now you've got the disparity in the games played, and – I mean, how do you see that playing into the, the playoff selections? Well, I, I'm one of these big people. I'm not a big analytics guy. I think this is going to be much more of a subjective uh, selection than ever before. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I, uh, I mean, I just think you, the people on the committee are going to actually have to do their homework and watch games and try to determine the best four teams as opposed to the teams with the – highest numerical rankings. I think that's a good call there. Um, again, I wish they had, I wish they had, you know, some, obviously the major, major league baseball, the, I don't know about the NBA, but everybody ex has expanded their playoff and changed their playoffs this season. I, I don't know that I want to see MLB keep, you know, 16 teams in the playoffs, but this would have been a great season for them to experiment with eight or even 16 teams, I think. So. Yeah. I'm not sure about 16, but eight I'm, I, I'm buying because it really allows you to in, include all five teams in the Power Five conferences oh. and still make room for a group of five team uh, like BYU uh, and maybe two other at-large teams because it appears that the SEC has at least three teams uh you know, if you include Georgia and Florida and maybe even Tennessee, that might be good enough to be to, to merit consideration aside from Alabama. Yeah, I agree. Um, so getting into season a little, a little bit uh, in gen or more specifically, what's been the things that have surprised you so far about the games played so far? Is there anything that really stands out to you? Yeah, there's two, th there's probably two things. I'm not surprised at the teams at the top, Keith. The fact that Alabama and Clemson are, 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 at, are, are at the top of most polls and that Ohio State is still ranked in the top five, even though they haven't played a game. The, the, the things that have surprised me the most uh, are the, instability of the Pac-12. I mean, who would have guessed that Oklahoma would lose, already have lost two games to Iowa State and Kansas State, and Texas would have needed overtime to beat Texas Tech and would uh, have lost to TCU just last week. I mean, this was supposed to be the year Texas turned the corner. They have a legitimate quarterback in Sam Ellinger. Now like they are faced with a uh, must-win situation uh, when they play Oklahoma in the Red River Classic. Uh, and the game is obviously going to look a lot different than it did before because of the limited attendance at the Cotton Bowl and in the middle of what used to be a very crowded uh, state fair. I mean, you're going to see, um, you know, they're going to let fans in, but you're not. it's not going to be the same. I mean, I just hope for these teams that are allowing uh, uh, their fan bases to attend the games that they do the wise thing and at least social distance. I mean, last week they had to throw the entire SMU student section out of the game. And, frankly, the, the optics on the uh, 
Georgia Auburn game in Georgia did not look good because there was no social distancing in, among in the student section, and it was hard to miss because the game was a prime time. I commented last week. I don't know if it was on my show Friday with Ken Chatter, my Sunday show that I was watching some games as I'm sure you were as you're mentioning. And sure, yeah, there's people scattered around. You see a lot of people scattered around, but then you would find these huge clusters of people, like yes. 200 people, no masks. Yep. And I was shocked. And now we've got, we've come to the point, and I'm, I don't want to stand COVID forever here, but I'll <laughs> back a little bit. you and I talked about yesterday, you know, Ron DeSantis in Florida now has decreed that all the teams in the state, pro and professional, high school, I assume, if they're playing, can have full attendance at the games. And that's just an invitation to a problem in a state that has had upwards to <clears throat> 10,000 people testing positive for COVID in a given day. I, I wish they hadn't done that. I I really think this is not a political situation. This is a public health risk. Oh, obviously. Uh, and and I, you, nobody wants to see anybody get sick. And even worse, no one wants to see anybody die. And the idea that we've had 210,000 people uh, in this country die is a scary proposition. I mean, one one death is way too many for me. And look, we all hope for a, a vaccine. We all hope that life gets back to normal. But, you know, I just don't know why you would open the floodgates for something like that. Yeah. And I've said from the beginning, you know, as a huge sports fan, that sports is very important to the fabric of the country and, and you know, right. giving people sure. direction. But you got to do it in a safe environment. I said that from the beginning for the players, for the fans, their families. Um, well, and, you know, it's ironic. You, you could, I mean, pro teams can do it if they play in a bubble. We've seen that with the NBA, but they also put one hundred fifty million dollars into it. Yeah, just to just to assure that all of their players would be safe, and with the exception of. Uh, one or two players who decided to recklessly leave the bubble. I mean, most of the players have been very good about this, but it's a, I'm, look, they're making huge money, but it is, a, it also, it's also a sacrifice being away from your family for sure. a extended period of time. And it's expensive too. I, for the me, if you're a member of the media yeah. and you want first tier access to those games, I mean, it's probably going to cost your paper about $72,000 for three months. I mean, if you include the fact that it's $600 a night for a hotel room uh, and, and, and daily testing and, uh, and, and, and food, and you can't get, you can really only go three places. You can yeah. go to the practices, you can go to your hotel, or you can go to, or you can go to the games. And now you have access during that period of time to the coaches and the players. But for the most part, you're in a situation where you are locked into your room uh, at any other time. Yeah. Or it's a much more tenable, uh, or tenable situation for the NFL and college football as spread out as they are. And, right. Um, but hopefully we'll stay safe. We'll stay smart. I mean, we want to watch the games. I mean, there's, there are. Yes. You know, there are some big surprises this year. It's very funny to look at the, you know, any of the top 25 rankings and you got, I don't know, five, six, seven teams and some of them that haven't even played a game yeah. Um, yet. But some of the surprises, I'm a Miami fan. Um, my stepson graduated from there. Very good. Uh, before he moved on to North Carolina for his graduate uh, studies, but he's still a Miami fan. So his mom and I still are. And they're playing great. They got a big game with Clemson this week, obviously. They really, they really do. I mean, I really think they finally have found a quarterback. That kid is I good. think Derek King, I watched him play at Houston live uh, in a game where he put up over 500 yards total offense. Uh, and he's capable of big numbers. The thing that I like about him is he hasn't thrown an interception yet. Uh, now, that may change this week. They have a huge game against Clemson, and this will tell us a lot more. And the last couple of years, Clemson has beaten them ninety-two uh, by a combined score, ninety-two to three. The games have not been the games. Have not been, 
But I, I will that. say this. I think this is certainly the best team that Miami's had uh, in close to a decade. I, I, I really like the – they're capable of scoring points. I mean, so they will at least be able to keep up with Clemson the scoreboard. I just don't know if they can outscore a team like Clemson, which looks like it's constantly in cruise control. I mean, they've got three legitimate stars in uh, Trevor Lawrence and uh, uh, Travis Etienne and uh, Amari Rogers, who look like they can score anytime they touch the ball. And Lawrence is having a good year. He's thrown for 10 touchdowns and, uh, they have not really been pressed at all in a league that I think is probably better in a lot of spots, not quite as good in some key spots. I think Florida State has been a disaster. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I mean, I, I know it's a new coach. I'm not <clears throat> sure how much he inherited. They're down to the third quarterback already, Travis Jackson. And uh, – uh, their games have not been – I mean, the game against Miami was not even close. And that's an early season game that has been traditionally uh, competitive. Uh, I went to all of those great Miami-Florida State games when uh, Bowden uh, and uh, uh, Jimmy Johnson and Erickson were, were, were coaching down there in the late 80s and early 90s in every game came down the last second place. You know, I've talked a lot about uh, with some of the other guests I've had about, you know, certain sports and, and the sports are better when certain teams are good. And obviously college football's got their yes. perennial contenders, right? But I think college football's a lot better when Miami and Florida State are good. Well, I mean, you know, anytime you have teams with great rivalries yeah. and years of tradition, uh, it's funny, Miami never really – we're, well, it's been almost 40 years since 1980 when Howard Snellenberger started turning it around for good. But, uh, you know, they were kind of, they and Florida State were kind of Johnny come lately's. But, you know, Florida produces on the average about 250 Division I prospects. They do as well as anyone in the country, including Texas and, uh, California in terms of players who can make an impact on the field. The, 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 the foot speed at the grassroots level is enormous. And you see teams in the SEC constantly going into Florida to recruit athletes. Yeah. When, so when Florida can keep them at home, that's when they're good, right? When the Florida team. Well, I mean, you don't need to keep a lot. If you, if you get 25 a year, I mean, or 20 a year, you're probably going to lock yourself into a top 10, top 15 team. I mean, yeah. obviously it helps to have uh, a franchise player for you. But, uh, I mean, the level of play at, 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 in grassroots is pretty impressive. Yeah. It, you know, Florida State being down, it's a shame because we, we lose out on what could have been a really good matchup uh Saturday Absolutely. night with Notre Dame and Florida State. Yeah, I mean, look, probably not. Notre Dame, I mean, I think I think Notre Dame has a good team. I think that uh, um, they have a very good offensive line. They've got a legitimate quarterback in book. They've got decent running backs. Uh, but last week they had twenty five people who were quarantined. Yeah, I mean, and they lead the country in uh, uh, COVID positive testing. And that is a scary thing. So you never know who you're going to have on the field. They were they had to cancel their, their one game against uh, Wake Forest earlier this season uh, after they really started getting, getting it going. I mean, they were so-so, I thought, in the first half against Duke in the opener. But I think they have a lot of talent. I'm not sure how competitive that game will be. I worry about – I don't know that you can take a third-string quarterback uh, into that game, and and everybody's last name isn't Flutie. You know, I mean, you're, 
you're in a situation where you're playing against pretty good football players and yeah. you you know i i just don't know this is going to be a uh, a year they write home about in florida state i think uh would, the only chance florida state has got in my mind is if notre dame is affected by this two-week layoff and maybe yeah. lack of you know being able to p prepare like they normally yeah, they, yes i yeah. look that that's the way it is i mean who would have guessed Oklahoma would go through what they're going through? Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, it's it, it's it's different. I mean, and every time you lose a game, it seems to be magnified because you're playing so you're playing so few non-league games or by games where you can build up momentum. Yeah. Yes. Bless you. Thank you. I can use all the help I can get. It's just a cold. <laughs> trust me. <laughs> That's where we live. I would go, oh, hope he's okay. <laughs> now nah, <I'll> live. <laughs> For those of you who might be just joining us, my guest today is uh, Dick Weiss, Hall of Fame sports writer. Uh, he's covered college sports for longer than he probably cares. Way, way too long. I've been to uh, 47 Final Fours. Wow. That's awesome. Uh, I started going soon. right out of college, yeah. and I've been to 30, 38, 38 national championship games. So I've been very, very fortunate. Now, sadly, I'm not sure how this year will work out. I mean, I was in New York last uh, spring for the Big East tournament, when they canceled during the second day and yeah. we are leaving uh, the building right after they canceled half time and then and they are literally pushing us out the door because word had already spread that uh, uh, two ushers had come down with it. Uh, and this is back in the day when New York was announcing 28 cases. And I think there were a lot more. And uh, so, one o'clock, I go back, and my wife is at the Met, and uh, I wait for her to get home, and we just back up and, and leave, and that is the last time I have been close to, to a live sporting event. It's a shame, because I love the feeling of being at a big game. Especially Especially the yeah, right, the passion and the, and, and the buildup before a huge college game. It, particularly in football, because it's so important in the in the deep south, really jumps up and 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 grabs you uh, every Saturday. I haven't, you know, I don't know the next time I'm going to see a game. Maybe I don't know if I'll go to the to the finals in Miami this year or not. I mean, uh, I don't know how they're even going to deal with the media down there. Uh, uh, because you know, or if that many media are going to go, I mean, we we've, we've seen a total change, Keith, in the way games are covered. Yeah. I think we're seeing a lot less people go to college games, particularly on the road, largely because newspapers and websites have discovered that money is money. Money that's not spent is money that they can save for other things particularly professional sports. Um, I think that right now the worst thing to happen to college football writers is the fact that newspapers have discovered that you can actually watch the game from your couch and now they have Zoom press conferences mm -hmm. afterwards. And even if you go to the games, you're not getting individual one-on-ones with any of the players. Yeah. So newspapers are saying, do we want to pay for airfare do we want to pay for a car rental? Do we want to pay for a hotel room? Do we want to pay for food? Uh, so you can go to a game that will really only be attended by at, by at the most 15,000 people when you can watch the game at home, uh, get the same material that you might get uh, if you were live because you're not going to get any of the players out in the field. And you're not going to get any players in the visiting locker room. And so you are basically going to, and you are basically have uh, a situation where you have six foot distancing. Uh, and uh, 
So you, you tune in your your computer, you listen to the post game press conference. And that's what you get. And you're not going to get to know any of the players. This year. And you can do it all from your couch, just like you said, virtually. You can, you can, and I, I think it's I think it's going to change the way people at least cover that sport. Yeah. Um, well, circling back to the, to the games a little bit uh, this weekend, sure. there's a couple of good big, big matchups. Obviously, Alabama and Mississippi, while it may not be the marquee game, <laughs> we got one of the most interesting coaching matchups this week with Clint well, coming back to yeah. play as head coach. Uh, yeah, Kiffin was actually uh, Nick Saban's assistant coach for three years when they won three SEC championships, and they won a national championship in uh, 2015. The next year, right before the championship game uh, against Clemson, Nick fires him and replaces him with Steve Sarkeesian, mm-hmm. who is another former Southern Cal assistant coach. And, with an interesting background. Yeah, and Lane ends up going off into uh, – um, Purgatory for a couple of years down at one of the smaller schools in Florida. And now he is That's back at Ole Miss. And it hasn't taken him long to take on uh, take on save. And he tweaked him a little bit this week. He suggested that uh, if uh, both of those players were uh, were on the field, there's no way that saving could cover him. And he's probably right. But then he referred to him as an elderly man. <laughs> uh, Saban is 68, but I don't know that he'd want to be uh, listed as elderly. I mean, he yeah. is as active as they come. And uh, I have a feeling there's no real love lost. But, uh, you know, Saban is 20-0 and 0 against former assistant coaches who have gone on to become head coaches in college. And Kiffin is just uh, another one on the list. I have a sense he might keep the foot on the gas pedal if he gets ahead in this game. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, the only thing that 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 that, that Ole Miss really has going for him is their ability to score. Yeah. So I have a feeling that the, I mean, while Kiffin can try, can and they, they both can try to control the tempo of the game, but I think that. Uh, Right now, Ole Miss is still a one-dimensional team. If you looked at last week's game against Kentucky, it was 42-41 in overtime. And I think that's the game they're going to try to play. Unfortunately, I don't know that you can do that against an Alabama team. that looks like it's capable of getting 50 in any given game this year. I mean, what they just – throttled A&M last week. And, you know, a lot of people thought, you know, they lost Tua, they lost Judy, they lost Ruggs, so they lost the bulk of their wide receivers. They actually might be as good or better in uh, those positions this year. I mean, uh, Jalen Waddell and uh, 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 the kid Minky and, and the quarterback, Mac Jones, he looked yeah, like they can throw it. They look like you can put a ton of points on the board. I mean, it's a it's a lot different Alabama team than you saw like when they had Mark Ingram and they won in two thousand nine and they were basically just setting up in an eye formation and running behind a NFL offensive line and and, and beating teams down. This team is playing a lot more like Sarkisian's uh USC teams back when he was the offensive coordinator there, and it's wide open football, and they're a lot harder to defend this year than they ever were. Yeah, you mentioned Mac Jones, and uh, he he was a big question mark coming into the season in a lot of uh, corners. Yes. Yeah. Quieted the doubters for sure. Uh, and it didn't take long. I mean, last week he had 435 and threw for four touchdowns, and, you know, he's played his way into at least some – Heisman watches. I mean, uh, obviously that league has got their share of great quarterbacks and Kyle Trask is off to a great start down in Florida, but uh, uh, this kid is going to be in the, could very easily finish in the top five in the Heisman. Yeah, I see De'Ara King there too, myself, but Yeah, you like that, don't you? I do. You know, the like amazing that. thing about King too is he's 5'10". Yeah, it's not like it's not like he's the prototypical uh, pro guy. Although 
Russell Wilson's done fairly well in the league, and he's not the biggest guy in the world. What about the? Uh, I mean, you mentioned Texas A and uh, Texas A and M a minute ago. They got a a big game, I guess, against Florida State, but or Florida this week. Excuse me. And you know, it seems like um, they're always they're another team that they're always re- they're ready to turn a corner, and they just don't ever get around that corner. It's a big <laughs> corner. And you know, the irony is, I mean, they went out of the way to hire Jimbo Fisher. Yeah, they paid him a truckload of money. I mean, his his total package over multiple years has to be close to eighty five million dollars. Uh, and uh, they he gave up fifty two last week to Alabama. Um, they're they're at a point now where that league is so good that a lot of people who are decent coaches fail because they just don't have the same level of talent. Now, there's no reason why A&M should not be able to get players. I mean, they have uh, unlimited budget down at College Station. I mean, I there are some people who think their budget is – the equal of Texas's budget, and I don't know that Texas has a budget. You know, <laughs> I, I, just, I just think they spend. But uh, the you know the last five or six years, the Sumlin era was not great, and Jimbo is looks like he's still in the middle of rebuilding. It's never a good year to rebuild in that league because there are too many good teams in Florida. Looks like they can put a lot of points on the board. I mean, they're the only team with a tight end, Kyle Pitts, that probably is a legitimate um, Heisman candidate. I mean, who would have guessed a tight end would fall in that category? But his first game, he has four touchdowns. The next game, he scores two more. He and Trask have become a lethal combination. Yeah. Well, you know, I hope that they will be – Fairly healthy through here. Get through the season. Uh, so do I. Give me a uh, – I'll put you on the spot and give me your final four. Oh, I think it's – I think it'll probably be most of your favorite teams. I think there, there's a, a legitimate shot for the SEC to get two teams in if everything falls in, in the right way. I. I think you'll have Clemson. I think Alabama. I think Ohio State could be very good. And I think right now, I still think, I still like Georgia ahead of Florida because I think they're a little bit more advanced defensively. I think the Auburn game last week was a big tell when they went, when, when they took a 24 to 3 lead and won 27 to 6. That was pretty impressive to to me, and there there, well, I guess we'll know a lot about them this week. They have Tennessee this week, and both yeah. teams like to run the football. Both teams have legitimate running backs. Both teams have legitimate offensive lines. Uh, but if they win that game, I mean, it's really a three way race for the for the East. But if they win the East, this might and and finish unbeaten in their section. It might be a year where. They get in. I'm sure Notre Dame would love to make a, uh, a case for themselves. I don't know, given the fact they're playing in the ACC, whether the selection committee would take two ACC teams. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, that 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 uh, Tennessee game, uh, Tennessee Georgia game this weekend is obviously a very interesting game. Uh, for <laughs> so obviously we're looking at chalk basically for the. For the I, well, I mean, it's it's usually been chalk. I mean, this is yeah, not no, the yeah. uh, this is not the NCAA basketball right. tournament where you can turn around and see Butler and VCU in a Final Four, or right. you know, look. I mean, or, or see uh, Auburn and uh, Texas Tech in in a, in a Final Four. I mean, I mean, it's a lot more wide open in college basketball because of the amount of one and dones than it is in college football where kids, most kids stay, have to stay three years. And if they play as freshmen, they're probably going to be, they're probably good enough to be stars. If you had to, uh, if you had to pick an outlier, somebody who might crash the party, 
you can imagine who I like to crash the party, I guess. Uh, but hey, like Miami. Party. I'm not yeah. sure that they. I'm not sure that they have enough to beat Clemson this week. Maybe right. I mean, uh, 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 the game's at Clemson. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the, it, the, that makes it all 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 all, all the tougher for them to go on the road. But uh, I'm trying to think of a team that might surprise people. I see I just don't think there's a better team than uh oh, than Ohio State in the Big Ten. Uh and I'm not sure whether the Pac twelve is gonna get the same type of street cred as teams who have played um for an extended period of time and are 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 well known to the fans by before the end of October, the, yeah. the start of November. I mean, there are a lot of people who like Oregon. Uh, I'm not sure if I like them enough to place them ahead of the teams in the top ten. Now, I mean, uh, I just, you know, maybe maybe Tennessee. Maybe Tennessee, if they were to win this week. I mean, look, they, they put 232 yards uh, rushing on Missouri last week. Now, I know it's Missouri, but, but they they look like a dominant ru- rushing team there. Uh, and the other team that I think is interesting but may not have enough quality points is BYU. I, I mean, I mean they. I mean, their quarterback has completed Zach Wilson eighty-five percent of his passes in three games. They have they have had over five hundred yards total offense in three games. They have scored forty or more points in every game. Their biggest problem is they don't play a ranked team in the schedule. That was my next question: Are they do they play enough good teams? They don't play that. There is not a ranked team on their schedule. Yeah, and uh, you know, I'm not sure that. I mean, I think they they have a legitimate shot to finish the season unbeaten. Uh, I they have Boise State this year in May, uh, uh, but uh, they go unbeaten. It wouldn't surprise me, but I'm not sure that people won't look at their schedule and say doesn't work for me. You actually have a better shot of playing in the game, I think, if you play in a league like the American, which traditionally has got three or four teams that are pretty competitive in any given year, even if Central Florida has already lost a game, uh, than you do if you play an independent schedule. I was always surprised that uh, they chose to go independent, especially with problems scheduling games after uh, after uh, September. I mean, right now, a lot of the major conferences are in a situation where they are uh, moving up the number of league games that they play, which means there is less chance of you getting an opportunity to play any of their teams after the middle of September. Well, that's what forced Notre Dame to play a full ACC schedule, right? I mean, oh uh, yeah, they could have been in big trouble. Because, yeah. I mean, if they didn't join that league right now, yeah. because they, they, I mean, at the time you had a lot of teams that were weren't even sure they were going to play. And one thing Notre Dame, it's a business in Notre Dame, despite what they might tell you. I mean, I mean, football is an important part of the college tradition there and they want, they want their games. Now they have uh, limited attendance to their student body and faculty this year. I mean, I know that Dick Vitale, who's a close friend of mine called up and he gives a lot of money to the school and he's a huge Notre Dame fan. And, uh, he couldn't, he could not get tickets to the games. They are mm-hmm. restricting it. I mean, they're almost trying to create their own bubble. I mean, give or take a president that shows up at the Rose Garden without a mask and ends up with COVID. They, they, they are, they, they are uh, uh, trying to keep uh, the uh, attendance restricted to students and faculty on their campus. 
Well, it's going to be an interesting season. I hope we can uh, make it to the end, uh, get to the playoffs. So do I. So do I. Relatively healthy, and everybody stays healthy. Let's, uh, <laughs> so, again, my guest, uh, for anybody who's just joining, and I'll say hi to David and Kyle and Bob. Bob Engel, my dad, is here again today. Hello, Bob. And Very nice. My stepmom, Jeanette. They're always here uh, supporting me on Friday mornings, group, I think. Group yeah. support. Group support. Very good. Um, we'll switch gears a little bit, or my host is, uh, I didn't say, I didn't say what I was going to say when I cut in there. My host or my host, my guest is Dick Weiss, Hall of Fame sports writer. We just got through talking a little bit about college football and I want to switch gears in our last little, uh, bit of time here, Dick, and talk a little bit about the uh, college basketball season, which is amazingly right around the corner. Um, what do you see there? I mean, who are, is there any, I mean, we, obviously we've well, got, a, this may uh, be the year Gonzaga wins the national championship. Yeah. I really like the personnel. They they lost their big kid uh, from last year, but they they have so many bodies, uh, and he has done such a good job of resourceful recruiting in Europe. That and and and, and he's now starting to attract um, players like Jalen Suggs, who was a top ten recruit out of Minneapolis. And is going to go to school there. When you have, when, when you reach that point, you know it doesn't matter what league you play in. You yeah. are judged uh, uh, on on your success. And Mark Few has never been afraid to schedule anyone anywhere. I mean, I, I give him, I give him a lot of credit. And I think this may be the year that that they that they that they win the whole thing. I mean. There are a number of teams um, out there like Baylor and Villanova uh, that will make a push. Baylor got lucky. They got both of their guards, McTigg and, and Butler, to come back after they both applied for the uh, for the NBA draft. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think we're lucky in the fact that a number of people have decided that you know, there's only 60 slots in a draft. And uh, – 144 people originally applied for the draft. I don't know that you, you know, just when you do the math, somebody's not going to end up being selected. I don't care how many uh, agents tell you late first round, everybody can't be late first round. Right. Right. And we're and we're very lucky that a number of those players have come back. And even though I feel like we are looking at new stars almost every year now because uh, the first round selections are uh, uh, almost all freshmen. I mean, I would bet this year that you probably will have nine of the 10 guys go in the first round will be freshmen. And in 22 or 23, when they open the door for high school kids to come, come out, um, uh, you're going to start seeing a lot more players who would be stars in college leaving, but it also might allow players to stay for more than one year or two. What about, uh, I've got a couple of, uh, and I'll ask you about a couple of quick teams because I'm going to ask you about some, again, some outsider hmm. outside possibilities there because they're always in the NCAA, as you mentioned, some people that come out of nowhere. And there's a couple of teams that intrigue me. Rutgers is one of them. We talked about them. Uh, they I'm a I'm a huge Steve Michael guy. I I I loved him when he was at Stony Brook. I loved him when he was at Rutgers. I think that when he was uh, looking at this job, he got so much negative reinforcement. Most people said, "Why do you want to go there? They've just gone through six coaches. They changed three leagues." It's an impossible situation. The guy who convinced him to take a shot at this job was Jim Calhoun. He says he think, thought it was a sleeping giant. They won 11 games at home last year. They definitely they hadn't been to the NCAA tournament since 1991. I think they would have had their name called last year. I don't know how high that would have been, maybe seven or eight uh, as a seed. Probably, but they won games last year without anyone on their roster averaging over 13 points a game. But he did play eight or nine people. 
They play, they play relentless defense. They rebound the ball extremely well off the defensive glass. They have two guys who I think could emerge as stars this year. Geo Baker is a point guard from New Hampshire who was really kind of overlooked by a lot of people and has become a legitimate Big Ten point guard. And Ron Harper Jr., mm-hmm. who uh, is on a number of um, – all conference first, second, or third teams. Uh, and um, they have size. They signed a 6'11 kid from Roselle Catholic. It's the first time they've gotten a top 50 player in a while. They have Miles Johnson back at, at, at the center spot. I mean, and even though they lost a kid, McConnell, who was uh, going to medical redshirt this year, they have seven or eight players in their rotation who got meaningful minutes last year. And I think they could be uh, uh, very good again. I mean, they've got the students back involved, Keith, which I think is really important. I mean, the rack can be a very difficult place to play if you get student involvement. And uh, I was at a couple of their games. I saw them beat Maryland toward the end of the year. I saw them beat Minnesota on Sunday. Uh, and they shut down key players on both teams and uh, really did a good job shutting down the three-point shot when they played Maryland, did a very good job taking the point guard car out of the equation when they, when, when they, when they played Minnesota. So they really play hard defensively. It's become a, a calling card for them. And, uh, Obviously, it's a team that still has to learn how to win on the road, but they had one game that they had to win to lock up what I thought was a bid last year. It happened at the end of the season. They won at Purdue, which is a pretty good win for them on the road. And so they had some momentum going into the uh, going into the uh, uh, Big Ten tournament out in, Minneapolis, out in Indianapolis. What about uh... – you know, a couple of uh, historically prominent teams that have fallen on harder times uh, and maybe on the way back, uh, uh, Indiana, UCLA. Do you see any – have any thoughts on those? I teams? think UCLA uh, is much was much better toward the end of the year than they were at the start of the year. I didn't know if they'd get out of the funk after the start of the year, but they got a huge break when Chris Smith came back. I mean, they always are going to get good players. And, uh, you know, they're always going to lose players who always end up making NBA rosters. Yeah. But I think Mick Cronin has been willing to change his philosophy. I and mean, when he was at Cincinnati, he liked to micromanage. He liked to play games in the 50s. Uh, he's let his kids go a little bit more this year, and it's really paid dividends. I, I think the Pac-10 is an up-tempo league, and if you're unwilling to play that, it makes it a lot harder to recruit players. Although I'll say this, there's so many good players in the SoCal region, uh, particularly in uh, L.A. and Orange County, that if you can get your share, you should be competitive. Now, is UCLA good enough to win the league this year? I think that they're still going to have to show me they can win on the road. I like uh, USC's front court with the Mobleys. I like Oregon just because I think that they found ways to uh, get it done with whatever personnel that they have under Dana Altman. But I think UCLA is 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 is. Is, is, is going to make a shift to where they can be a contender on a lot more uh, consistent basis. Now, what well, your other team was? Indiana. You know, this is, this, is it. this is Archie Miller's seventh year. I mean, they, I mean, they're at a point where they have to get to a uh, – um, they have to establish a uh, – uh, a pattern of getting to the NCAA tournament. I mean, yeah. they were really on the edge last year. You, know, you remember Archie had that big blow up with Joe Lenardi over uh, um, uh, 
the way that the team was evaluated. They've got a very good young freshman, you know, Linder, who's a guard, but they've lost a lot of, a lot of key players, one who transferred, another who left early for, for the pros. I don't know that getting the best players in Indiana anymore is enough, particularly the southern part of the state. I mean, uh, and a lot of kids from the northern part of the state are going to other schools. They're either going to Michigan State, they're going to Purdue. They're, I mean, they're going to Illinois. They're, they're not, it's not like they're totally locked into going to Indiana the way that they were. And I'm not sure if the state itself is producing the amount of players that it used to. You don't see, you don't see Kentucky in there recruiting. Um, they haven't been there since Tig, and that was like uh, 2012. Yeah. Well, we only got a few minutes left here, Dick. But I, I, I have to touch on one more subject, which is kind of is more of a local subject, but it involves a national figure, who actually had some ties to uh, a team up nearby me, and it's in the MAC, and. Uh, a coach that you collaborated with in the past, Rick Patino. I think they're going to win 23 games. 23 uh, games at Iona. Yeah. Going to make the tournament. I'll say that. I, I think, the, yeah, I think that, I, I think Timmy Kloos did a great job building a foundation and probably ha had he not been sick, um, could have continued that streak for an indefinite period of time. The league itself is so. It doesn't. It's not as stable as you would like, or that it used to be used to. Iona's the one team that's done it. I mean, Rick went in and recruited six pretty good players, and none of them visited campus because of COVID. Right. And he still got them to come. He's got great connections in New York. I think they could wind up being the uh, Gonzaga of the East before it's over. If you take a look at their roster. I mean, they are signing players from all over the world, and they've been able to reach in. They got a kid from Christ the King this year is pretty good. They've been able to reach into the New York Catholic League and get their share of kids. And I think that he, when you can coach, you can coach. Yeah. Um, I I will say this: Had Rick Pitino stayed at Kentucky, and he never taken the Boston Celtics job. He would have been Mike Krzyzewski. He he would have won five national championships. He would have been the Olympic coach. His life would have been changed. But he was also offered fifty million dollars to go to Boston. Hard to say no. And, you know, that's hard to say no. <laughs> but you know, it, it didn't work out there. Uh, frankly, he. He won a championship at Louisville. I know that they, they say they took it away, but he won a championship at Louisville. He's been to, he's been to the Final Four there, but I don't think his success at Louisville was ever the same as it was at Kentucky, where he was a legitimate threat to win a championship in 93, 96, 97, uh, and 92. Um, and, now, and in a brief period of time, he got that thing up and running to a point where they were a monster team every year. I mean, they, they were, and kids, and kids wanted to play. He, he was almost at a point like Krzyzewski where he could select rather than recruit in the uh, mid South. Deep South. Well, I'm not confident that there's going to be fans allowed in the TU center when they come up here to play Siena, but I hope there is. Cause I'd, lo I'd love to see that team play. Yeah, how are things going at Siena? Are they starting to? They uh, they had a de decent year last year, and uh, they've got a lot of kids back. And I think I know they got they had gone through their share of coaches. I was uh, up and very close. Yeah, I was very close to Paul Hewitt when he had it going a little bit. Great coach, yeah. There. I mean, I, I, you know, there's a guy, and look, he did get to a Final Four at Georgia Tech. Uh, yeah. Didn't quite work out for him uh, at, at Mason, but really a class act. I mean, just a good guy. Fran McCafferty had some good success there, Franny, too. I've known Franny since he's been in ninth grade. I, it's funny, when he was a senior in high school, his dad called me and uh, he wanted my advice. Um, 
uh, about uh, where he should go to school. And I told him at the time he should go play for Pete Carrillo at Princeton, showing what I know. He ends up going out the next night, getting 50 in a high school game, playing the McDonald's All-American team, signing at Wake Forest, transferring to Penn, getting into coaching. And I think that he has a team at Iowa this year that probably will be a contender along with Wisconsin to win the uh, Big Ten championship. Yeah. He's got the best play, got the best player in college basketball, and Luca Garza, and 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 it's and both of his kids are playing now too. Yeah, which is yeah. nice. He's an underrated coach. I like him too. He's got a great personality. And yeah, I mean, we've been friends for a long, long time. Uh, um, Call him up. Tell him I want him on the show. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Dick, I'm going to wrap it up here. And listen, we, there's so much more we could cover. And I, once we get into the heart of basketball, college basketball season, I'd love to have you back on, I think, to talk some more about that specifically. Okay. If you no don't. problem. What's the name of the new book again? It, uh, it's called From the Bench to the Boardroom. And, uh, um, uh, again, it's a story about um, uh, a player from uh, – yeah. Uh, the Rutgers glory years who ended up going on to have enormous success in, uh, in, 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 in professional business. It's a, it's a feel good story. Well, I encourage everybody to get out there and look for it when it's available. I know I will be, uh, I want to thank, uh, Dick Weiss again, uh, for joining us today. Dick, if you want to wait a second, we'll wrap up quick when I, after no I problem. Up, we'll chat for a second. Sure. Right. I thank you for your time with us today. Hey, it was very, very nice talking to you. Thanks, Dick. Uh, don't send, you know, your voucher to the accountant until at least. Uh, <laughs> next pandemic. Thanks. Thanks, Dick. All right. I want to thank Dick Weiss for coming on with us today. Great, great guy. Um, again, very knowledgeable, as you can tell about uh, the college uh, world in football and basketball. We'll probably have Dick on again during the basketball season. Um, to where I grew up. Grew up. <laughs> shouldn't say grew up. Uh, but I've read uh, and followed Dick through the years as his coverage of college basketball, which is, which is exceptional. So um, I want to thank all of you. Um, can't see you all in the room as always, but I'll see you afterwards. And any comments you've made, I'll, I'll certainly comment on. I want to let you know that I'll be joining the, uh, the, the Mac and Jack show here at 915. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the Patriots and, and maybe some other topics. Not sure. Um, but if you want to look up that up on Facebook, you'll find me on that show this morning. And uh, next week, we will have Harvey Ayrton with us. So we look forward to that as well. And I'll be on Sunday at 9 a.m. Eastern time. We'll talk about the college football wrap-up, a uh, little NFL, probably some MLB playoffs, Yankees with a huge game five tonight. And uh, we wish them well. I think you'll see Garrett Cole again on short rest for the first time in his career. So I want to thank everybody for coming in today like the show or like the page like the show share the show and i appreciate your all of your support we'll see you next week